Tonight, I have with us Ross Stregley, and he's going. He's the executive director from Plant Select, and he's going to talk to you about um, choosing plants for compatibility and soil exposure, water, all of that. I'm Ruth Quaid. I'm with the City Girly Water Conservation Program. I'm going to turn it over to you, Ross. Thank you again for doing this tonight. Oh, you bet. Thank you. First off, I'm, I'm doing a talk on grouping your plants for compatibility and style. And I'll tell you right now, I am not a designer by any means. Uh, Emily is, and there is real talent in that. Now I've done a lot of gardens and I've built a lot of things. And I used to think I was pretty good at it, but really in reality, I was more functional than anything. And I also relied on choosing really good performing plants. And that made me feel like I was a better designer. And a lot of those plants were actually plant select plants. Um, I started a business back in 95, and that was when Plant Select was getting started. And I had that until about 2000 or beyond a little bit. And when I'd pick plants, I'd put them in the ground and say, you know, I wonder what this is going to do. It's a Plant Select plant. And then all of a sudden you keep returning. And you're like, oh my gosh, it is a really knockout plant. It is performing well. It hasn't been in the best conditions. So I am, uh, you know, I've tested these plants in my own experience years ago. And I look for that wow experience with every new plant that we bring. But it's a little more complicated than just bringing good plants. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. But let's start off with uh, grouping your plants for compatibility and style. You know, the biggest thing that we really need to be doing is actually landscaping for climate pack capability or compatibility. This is my friend's house. He actually owns a landscape company. And uh, he's up north of Cheyenne. Uh, Danny is his name and he owns Green Lawn Care, but he bought a property north of Cheyenne and this is what he's built. It's beautiful. Um, but you know, when you take a step back, one thing's missing from this, this picture, a neighborhood, right? It doesn't really blend into the landscape. It more is waiting for everything else to grow and people to come around it. And it's weird to think that way, but this program is really about getting you to change your mind or get, you know, put forth the ideas to changing your mind about what is appropriate and what really looks good. Now, Colorado has a lot of positive gardening um, features that California doesn't have, that the East Coast doesn't have. Anywhere you think there's really rich, dark soil, we can do a lot and we can do more actually, I think, than those other areas. So I want people to remember that this is really where we live. Um, I go out here to the Pawnee Buttes grasslands quite a bit. It's just east of Nunn. And uh, this is really what it is. It's a steppe climate. It's the North American steppe. It's very dry. Um, people wonder what a steppe climate is. And for those that haven't heard, I, I think the best explanation of it is that basically it can receive as much precipitation as in a year, as what is going to evaporate out of the earth in that area in a year, which means that the water is really running at a zero balance every year. Now, obviously you get more snow in the winter and things like that, and then it gets really hot. And so it gets cattywampus in terms of when that moisture comes. But over the course of the whole year, we lose just as much as we gain. And so, we get about 10 to 20 inches of rain. You know, our average is 15. This is none. That's 14 inches. And that includes snow. Um, but anywhere between 10 to 20 inches of, of precipitation annually is where steppe climates usually fall into. And they are known as usually high places. Grass is one of the only plants that really can thrive there, trees and woodies, they don't, it's just too challenging. But uh, the North American step is, is really where we are. And this is the reason Plant Select started. So I have to mention a couple things about Plant Select because not everybody has heard about it, but our mission is to create a plant, plant uh, choices for a new American landscape inspired by the Rocky Mountain region. Now, 20 years ago, you know, Plant Select only had 10 plants that they would release a year, if that. And so after three years, they had 30 plants. And, you know, they're trying to get new plants, bringing in native plants and things like that. Now, Plant Select promotes 160 plants. 
there are so many plant choices and combinations to make that there is no reason that we should not be conserving lots of water and having just beautiful landscapes. And I would say concerning water, we need to be watering only once a week. And that doesn't include trees so much, but I think that the plants are out there that we can make changes and we can provide something that looks fantastic. Now, turf isn't really gonna do it on once a week um, unless you let it go dormant in the summer. And I'm talking about Kentucky bluegrass, but um, all your plants, your perennials, your shrubs, um, and then there are some trees that will be able to take it completely zero. But uh, we'll get into that a little later. Anyway, this uh, plant select is a collaboration of Denver Botanic Gardens and Colorado State University. It was born out of there uh, where, you know, the horticulturists at Denver Botanic Gardens said, look at all these plants that grow here from around the world. What are we doing growing stuff that's just out east? And then Colorado State would do a lot of the trials. Um, plant Select actually originally started as a woody plant introduction program, but that was taking so long to do, they decided to jump into the perennial sides. And now it's just, it's, it's, we have annuals and we have, we don't have bulbs, but we have a lot of different plants. So we go and we trial all these plants. Um, I get a lot of questions and, and a lot of people make comments about, oh, no weeds, we're bringing in invasives. And that's not what we're about. Um, it's a, we put these plants into trial areas and we watch them, the perennials at least for three years and shrubs usually five to 10. But anyway, they have to meet these uh, eight criteria. So they have to thrive in broad range of conditions and that usually means soil. And I think specifically more adapted to clay, but I think that's changing a little bit. Uh, flourish with less water, that's a big priority. Um, because as you know, our population in Colorado is going to double, and I don't think we're going to get more snowpack as we uh, move into the future. That's not going to double. Anyway, tough, resilient uh, plants that can take the winter is really what that comes down to. Uh, we have so many freezes and thaws, it's really challenging on plants, and that's why a lot of maples don't do well and things like that. Uh, one of a kind and unique, new unique, so introductory program needs to be unique. Uh, disease, insect resistant, and long lasting beauty, non invasive, that's the big one, and we do watch out for that. Um, and then habitat friendly. So, that being said, there are a couple ways you can look at uh, compatibility with plants. And if you're an engineer, you're going to want to go to uh, now, engineers are not designers, and don't let engineers do the designs but they sure love statistics. So it was just this year, if you go up into plants, there's a tab that'll drop down and it's how much water to water plant select plants. And you can see, I went through, and this is all based on exper experience. Um, I've shared it with friends. I'm asking people to challenge me. Um, I overcompensated on a lot of this water because I know plants look always, they look better with a little bit of water. So. If you go in here and you look at this, if you water once a week, it makes everything simple to calculate. You know, our biggest problem with irrigation is, is that our plants are watered in inches. Our irrigation is run by 20 minutes in time. And then what we pay for in the end of the day, at the end is in gallons. And, and really that's too much. And then you think about, you gotta calculate square foot. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. But if you have, let's say, overhead sprays, you can go out and get a drip cup or a, a catch cup. And I saw one that Ruth had put a picture of up there. They're very easy to look at. You run your timer and you can measure how much time you're putting on. Now, if you have a lawn and you just put it out there, it's probably running about a quarter inch to a half an inch maybe um, for the 20 minutes that it's running unless it has a real low, low uh, heads. But from there, you can calculate how many how many gallons you're going to use and so let's say if you have uh i'll try and make this real quick though so i catch right here i catch point through a third of an inch right in 20 minutes if i water for 10 weeks once a week i'm putting down three inches of rain additional so let's say uh that plant if you can see down here below the three inches starts here this is supplemental irrigation 
So that would mean that if there's a three there, you're gonna water for 10 weeks, just once a week. And you're gonna pay for a 1.8 gallons per square foot. So it should be fairly easy to look at. Um, I encourage people to look at this. I put it together. I'm hoping to get all these plants actually tested, but uh, I'm excited about it. And that's a great place to start. But you know, the problem really comes with our brains. For whatever reason, we think that this is the garden we have to have. Um, this is what, uh, it's almost like what we've been grown up to thinking is a garden. Now, this is my friend's house in Chicago where they get 30 inches of precipitation a year. This is not adaptable to Colorado. They have things in full sun that would just die out here in full sun. Uh, those plants are really big and they're probably watering you know, maybe three times a week, but maybe twice a week, but they have more water to use as well. So we got to erase this out of our heads and start thinking about what's going to be next. And for horticulturists, most of the time when they think what's next, they think we've got to look in areas where there's a step region. And so this is Denver Botanic Gardens, and this is their um, step garden. And this is specifically the South African steppe garden. So all these plants in this area are from South Africa. You can see down here, this is dog tough. This is dog tough when it's not uh, mowed. So I actually prefer this to be used as a ground cover in garden, situ garden situations, but you could mow it. Um, it would be about 12, you know, you'd water it or you'd mow it about 12 times a year, only when it's growing, but it's, dormant and it acts just like buffalo grass in terms of how long it's green. But then you can see these are actually um, the Allen's, Apric uh, Allen's apricot delisperma. Um, these, this is in, they'll bloom from July to frost almost. I've seen them try and bloom after a snow. This plant here is the Diacea uh, interrogirima, in, I can never pronounce it, interrogirima, and that is the twin spur um, uh, the Coral Coral Canyon Twinsfer, and that is one of the greatest plants ever. It'll start blooming in July and it'll go all the way till frost. So um, I put the, I showed this slide because look at the style. Um, you know, there's a lot of low growing plants. It looks like a steppe climate. You know, if there's a lot of wind, there's not a lot of tall things. That's in South Africa. Then if you go and actually at Denver Botanic Gardens and turn directly south from that point of view that I just showed, this is the step garden from Patagonia in South America. This is, uh, all these plants represent that area. So, you know, during COVID times and we can't go travel the world, you can actually go to a lot of botanic gardens and they group their plants by locations of where they're growing, where they're from. And uh, they do that very well at Denver Botanic Gardens. So you can see this, this plant back here, this is actually a true pampas grass. Now pampas grass, are, um, are a, uh, an invasive species out in, in uh, California. And I don't know that they'd ever become here. It's a novelty to have. I don't think it, the plant, the plant, you know, Colorado really needs a cordideria because it's, uh, we've got a lot of other grasses that actually can fill that same spot. So we don't even need to worry about that. And then we have this, this is the Mordecai Children's Garden and this is a rooftop garden where they use a special kind of media that's uh, it's one third wood chips and then it's two thirds of um, two thirds of expanded shale. But in this area, you look at the style and this is what you kind of go with. There's a hodgepodge, um, you know, rooftop gardens are challenging. There's a lot of wind up there. There's very shallow, you know, the root zone is a very shallow. So things that grow tall will blow over eventually unless they're staked down. But you can see some pretty cool plants up here. And, and just think about when you're looking at these things, like what, what, what am I going for in my yard? Um, this is a lot less complicated than you'd believe. But this is a undaunted muley grass. This blooms in September. So this is like a lot later in the year. Um, they also have some avalanche uh, um, snow daisies over on this side, but they're already spent. But at any rate, there's a hodgepodge of things in this one. So step gardens, if you go online and you look, this is actually from Wikipedia and it does pretty good. There's, step, there's the cold step climates and you can see them right here. We are right in one of them, a couple down in Argentina. There's oh, 
over here in Kazakhstan, um, that's a place where a lot of plants are that Plant Select has gotten several plants from and actually has sponsored DBG horticulturists and curators to go over there and build relationships with botanic gardens there, get to know their flora and, and, and look for plants and interesting plants. So that's the cold step climate. This is actually the hot step climate. So you can kind of see here that these are areas down here towards Texas and you see the lower Rockies or it's lower Sierra Madres. And sometimes we can get plants from this area and they'll actually do okay in our area. Um, down here, you can see there are, there are some uh, plant select plants from that area as well, uh, Lesotho in uh, higher elevations. But um, anyway, so if you want to know where the step climate, the step regions are, you can go ahead and look at them. But in Colorado, this is why I think we have a better advantage as to a lot of places out there. On the left-hand side is this is the Gardens on Spring Creek, and that's a Lauren Springer design garden. It's called the Undaunted Garden, and this is the north side of that pergola. And she kind of has it sort of more of a sort of a scrub or a shrub and grass area, um, some ground covers. But this was taken in the winter time. I just took this uh, a couple months ago, or maybe a month ago. Um, beautiful. Look at it. I don't know where, anywhere else you can actually see you know, because there's not snow clomping it down, there's not um, weird weather events or too much water where it rots out, the snow melts, our snow here is almost always clean except for this last snowstorm, but that's in the winter time, and that's on the north side of that pergola. This on the, on the south side of the pergola is actually her garden as well, and you can see how different they look, but they are the same actually water kind of zone. Um, the one on the on the right hand side is the um, cactus garden, and it has a lot of plants from Texas and Mexico and things like that. Um, and that, if you look at that, that's actually that picture was taken in the fall. So in reality, when you're looking at two different seasons of the year, we can have just as beautiful and structure and texture um, going easily. Now, you, now imagine if those succulents were blooming; that would even be more fantastic. So the grasses, though, I think are the biggest part or the best part for residents. And I, we need to incorporate more of them. And I'm looking at bringing hopefully more carex and more grasses that are native to here. Um, they're just so useful and they're so creative. Um, and they're year round interest really, except for in the spring and that's when everything else is blooming. But this is Emily's house. The person who did the design for Garden in a Box, she carved out a spot a few years ago and um, on the, in that little border area and on the left hand side, I took that in October of last year. And there, this, this garden is almost all plant select plants. Um, down here, you can hardly tell, whoops, my mouse is moving slow and I don't know why. Down here is the uh, little Trudy. There's only a little bit of purple flowers left on it, but all these plants take very low water. Once a week would be just fine. This is Blonde Ambition. I don't even think it needs that any water. It's a native plant for the most part. Definitely this plant doesn't need any water. This is Standing Ovation. And Standing Ovation is really neat because when it comes out, it's, it's very blue in the summertime. And then it turns a really sort of, you see this purpley maroon sort of color. It has tints of that. And then it'll turn brown for the winter as you can sort of see over here, as a matter of fact, I took this picture just before the snowstorm and I'm kind of bummed because I was in a hurry and so I got a blurry one. Um, back here, you can actually see uh, red birds in a tree that have already bloomed and they're finished, but over here, it didn't stand up. Um, you still see the uh, this little patch of silver is the, is the uh, sea foam, sage, and then in the back, is the, um, is the um, Korean feather reed grass. Now Korean feather reed grasses, it kind of looks like it, it, it looks like an Eastern sort of frou-frou, I say frou-frou, but sort of that kind of feel of a plant where you'd see it in a garden with hydrangeas and things like that, because the inflorescence are very delicate and they're iridescent and they, they, you can see through them, but there's masses of them. 
And this plant can take it really dry. Um, I've seen it where it's been watered so much or too often. Um, if it gets three times a week and you don't cut it back before it goes to seed, you'll have little seedlings come up with it. So this is actually a plant that looks luscious, but really is xeric. Um, it looks great with watering once a week, but, and I think that's where I put it on that, on that list. But um, as you can see, we have things to look at. In the I ask and in the fall. Yeah? Can I stop you for a couple questions? Yeah, go one ahead. goes back. One question goes back to being invasive, and okay. um, it said you wanted to answer it live, but oh, I don't know if oh, you that typed what, that I was or not. Type. <laughs> I'll answer it okay, right now. well you I'll can't type, type and talk in. at the same time, probably. So, right. um, well, will watering by the appropriate grouping help limit any of invasive nature of some of the plants? You know what? Watering, reducing your watering is going to reduce all plants, native or not, in terms of their germination. I mean, plants have evolved here in America for, you know, where we are for, you know, thousands of years, and they've kind of adjusted their schedules to be with when the moisture comes, and when they can get pollinated, and then do it again. And um, that water in our step region really comes like March, and that's it. So if you don't germinate now, if you didn't have any water, you're probably not going to germinate. Now, the weeds that come in, they do the same thing. And some of them can outcompete or jump up faster than the native plants. But our real problem is watering three times a week. It's because that water, when you overhead water just blank areas, there is going to be some time during the course of the summer when the seed is going to reach a perfect germination point where the moisture is correct, the timing is correct, their contact with the soil is correct. And it's, it's, a, it's a game of, uh, of, of numbers, really. Um, the more times you water, the more times you open up that opportunity to have weed seeds grow. The less times you water, the more you're going to reduce that. So when you group all these plants together, you're going to reduce the watering a lot. And I guess I meant to say that with the, the, this Calamagrostis back here, um, the Korean feathered grass. And it's, that's my personal experience with it is, is I used to, I would spend a whole day weeding this at Denver Botanic Gardens because it was planted with a Veronica on a hillside that looks really lush when you water it quite a bit. And, um, you know, those two plants together made heck of maintenance for me. And I would go out and weed little bitty bitty plants that were this big because I couldn't let them because they're too hard to pull when they get a lot bigger. But I don't see this. I see this plant all over. It's all outside my office and uh, I don't see it going to seed at all. I see the hardy pampas grass. There's so many other grasses that go to seed. Uh, Miscanthus, I think, is, is going to be. A, I know out east it's on the, a lot of it's on the noxious weed list and I bet you it'll be out here, too. Um, the Ravina grass, that one definitely should be on the weed list out here. But at any rate, if you stop watering, then when you look at those plants, you won't find as many seeds, um, native or not. And I want yes. to remind you that he's talking about once a week after establishment. And that's why weed control is so right. important during establishment because you are giving more water, which means more water to the weeds too. Okay, that's so right. one more question and then I'll let you go on. This is about ornamental grasses. How often do the grasses need to be divided? That's one concern I have about using them heavily. What I would do is, you know, I know you're talking about how they grow out and then there's a, the, the center gets dies out. That happens a lot with miscanthus. It doesn't happen with little blue stem, which is this gorgeous thing right here. It doesn't happen with that. The bond ambition, it doesn't happen with the Korean feather reed grass as well. Um, that is really... Uh, a miscanthus sort of issue or a rabina grass. And if you have to do that just for the maintenance, you know, when things grow out into a ring, what I usually do is in terms of grasses is I'll take one wedge out of that ring and then I will, I will move that plant, give it away or, or relocate it to somewhere else in my yard and backfill. I dig out the center and I backfill with whatever topsoil is there. And then I let the, the plant actually grow back into itself. And that can be done if you're getting those ring, ring problems. But like I said, these grasses aren't like that. All right, thanks Russ. Sorry. Yep. 
Oh, that's okay. Um, just jump in. I, I, I saw those questions or one question, but it's too far. I'm losing my eyesight, so I can't see the questions now. Um, at any rate, this is another uh, garden where I just think, you know, this this is this is fall in Colorado. Um, everybody looks for red trees in Maine and things like that, but for fall, but this is really exciting because it'll last for months. These leaves don't blow away. So down here, what we have is a native grass, which is one of my favorites. I really want one in the program. It's um, Parabolus heteroleptus. It's prairie drop seed and it's native. And it's one of the best grasses you can get. It doesn't need any water at all. This right here is actually pearly everlasting. And I think that this plant, it's actually, uh, there's on the, if you go online and look, some people think that it's native and it's not, it's introduced from Asia, but it's been here for so long. I think people think it's native, but anyway, you have different panicums. Um, you can tell it's fall because they put their mums in their, in their things there. But these kinds of prairie meadow gardens are, is a style that's easily achievable. Um, these are clump grasses, uh, they don't spread out and they cover a wide area. So the only kind of time you're really gonna have to weed is in the springtime um, when, the, when, the, when the earth is sort of exposed. And a lot of times these grasses, what they do is when they lay over on the, on the mulch, they capture weeds that may have blown in and they make a perfect habitat for them to germinate in the spring. So when you cut them back in the spring, that's the best time to just kind of hoe out those little guys. But this is, uh, this now meadows are one of the harder um, um, plants to, or, or garden styles to maintain because a lot of the flowers that are prairie plants, they go to seed around and you need to be able to know which ones are gonna seed around and, and be able to deadhead them before they do that. Because ultimately, if you don't, you end up with a garden that's really heavy on one plant or just a few plants and they compete heavily for it. But in a garden like this, you want things that are defined, you want definition and you want uh, organization and it has to be clean. But these this style is, is where I think Colorado should be striving for. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's beautiful. So I'm also showing you places that I wish you would visit. These are places for inspiration this spring. This is another Denver Botanic Gardens one. That previous one is, was at Catfield Farms, which is also done at, uh, is um, work managed by Denver Botanic Gardens. But this is the Water Smart Garden by uh, the conservatory there at DBG. Now, Lauren Springer designed this years and years ago. And Dan Johnson, who maintains it, and he is a designer himself, and he is fantastic. He put these grasses in. This is a stipe of grass. Now, a lot of people are familiar with that little New Mexican feather, feather grass. Uh, designers love it. It just looks fantastic. And it, this is the, almost the same thing, but on steroids. So it gets like three feet tall. This is a stipe ichu. And I think they changed the, the genus name for stipe, but it's easier to remember. Anyway, um, that plant is from Argentina and it's not necessarily hardy, but here at Denver Botanic Gardens it is. And what's interesting with that New Mexican feather reed grass, I've seen it in New Mexico where they water and it goes to seed everywhere. And I've seen it up here in medians and I don't see it taking over. And I think that might be because they do the point uh, source irrigation where they use emitters and drip tubes. So the watering doesn't cover the other areas and those seeds don't germinate, but when they overhead, it, it can. Um, anyway, but we don't need all those kinds of grasses. We have this grass. This grass is actually from Germany. It was selected by, uh, by, by um, Lauren Springer. It's undaunted alpine, gra alpine grass. It's actually from the Alps. Now this grass, there's, you find different variants of it. The, her selection actually starts to arch out more and more, and it makes more of a mound. Um, this one isn't to the mound form yet. It's not large enough. It's only about two and a half years old, I believe. But it, it blooms in, in first of August. And then it's, uh, it puts on these kind of gold flowers, inflorescence, and then they turn to this. But this can substitute just as well as some of those other foreign grasses that might be a little more invasive and that's what we look for. So grasses, when you think of grasses, you should also, in the prairie, you should also think of penstemons and prairie plants. And I have to say, I, 
Penstemon grandiflorus is one of the best plants out there. It's native just on the east side of Colorado and up into the panhandle of Nebraska. I mean, it's an amazing plant for living in the plains and it gets like, you know, two to three feet tall. It's, it's a beautiful plant. It comes in all sorts of colors. Now here on the left-hand side, it's pictured in a mulch area. But if you had that opportunity to go to the Jeffco demonstration garden out there at the fairgrounds in, in Jefferson County, uh, this plant is almost a weed. They have, they built their demonstration garden on a pre-existing parking lot that was just compact. They added some topsoil. I think they tried to tear it up or rip it a little bit, but they top dressed it with mulch. And for whatever reason, this plant loves it there and goes to seed. And it comes out in blues, and purples, and whites, and pinks. That's what the center one is. And what it, it's just an incredible plant uh, that you should put in with tons of grasses. They're both natural together. And then on the far right-hand side, Plant Select is actually going to start promoting next for in the 2022, this plant that's been really kind of challenging to um, get from a nursery is uh, Liatris ligulostylus. This is um, Meadow Blazing Star. Now these are native all through the plains. They're native actually north of Colorado here in just north of Fort Collins. And um, I think their, 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 their height really depends on how much water they get. But the feature for this plant is anybody that grows it knows the monarchs love it. And it is a pollinator magnet like no other. Um, you'll find more butterflies on this plant. It, and I don't know what it is about this plant, but it's spectacular. Um, it blooms in August, so it's a fall color one. And that's another reason that a lot of nurseries, you know, it, it falls off their radar because, you know, a lot of gardening is impulse buys. And so when people are there in the spring, if it's blooming, they buy it. And then most people's yards end up with these yards that only bloom in the spring and nothing blooming in the fall. Um, the other reason Ligulus stylus is a hard one uh, to grow is it takes a long time in a pot. And then when you get it in a pot, it'll grow tall and it doesn't bloom the first year after you plant it. Um, it takes a couple years, but when it gets tall into the pot, then it tends to fall over and it flops and it'll also sort of wilt, even though it's okay, it'll start to, it'll hang its head, sorry, like that. And, um, and, and then it doesn't sell. So when you see this plant, you'll want to get it in the spring, get it in the ground as quick as possible and plant it small. They actually are little itty bitty tubers is what they make. And they're not a long lived plant, but I would encourage you to let it grow and flower and go to seed. And then you can actually spread it around a bit. Um, but I'm excited for that plant. Um, that'll fit a prairie garden style just perfectly. Here's another plant that can be sort of, there's a water wise sort of style, you know, where you see these rocks and plants are a little bit more spaced out. Um, but this plant is from Grand Mesa. It's native to Colorado, Penstemon mensarum. Incredible plant. You'd wonder how does this plant get so big? Cause it can be two to two feet. Um, these blue flowers are just incredible. Uh, blooms from June, April to June. Um, this is also another hard plant to find, but you should go to the nurseries and ask them about it. Say, I want it. Can you bring it in? Um, you know, a lot of times plants don't arrive on the shelves because they're, it's too complicated to arrange a load that makes it cheap enough for that, for that nursery to bring in the plants. So when, when summer rolls around, you know, they get a little bit nervous about selling plants that are, uh, you know, may not, that they'll have to do on sale and, and, and on the Labor Day and they don't want to do that. And I, it's completely understandable. It's a business decision. So if you want these plants, the, you'll have to do the research and know they won't be, this one will be blooming, but you'll have to know what you want when you go to the, the, the garden center. And uh, the other thing to mention is, is that this COVID is actually making us be less of an impulse buyer, I think, for plants, more of a researcher. And so that's why I'm really glad that all of you have tuned in today um, to listen. So then grouping more plants together, you know, you're considering your shade plants, you're considering your full sun plants, but I think these plants do fantastic. On the left-hand side, this is a demonstration garden down in Sedalia. Um, that's that's um, uh, Crystal Rivers, uh, Crystal River, uh, Veronica. It's a ground cover and it blooms, you know, from April to June. And it's a very white, uh, blue with a white center, um, low maintenance plant. And 
you can water those plants once a week. Now, if you give them shade, you're, you can actually, that'll be plenty enough for them, or at least part shade during the day. And the same thing with the um, erodium in the back. This is the golden cranes bill, and it is, uh, or storks bill, it is one of my most favorite plants because it's almost an evergreen plant and it just comes out and makes a muffin. Uh, the leaves are lacy and dissected and they're just so full of texture and a beautiful light green. Um, then they put on these sort of pale yellow flowers and it doesn't just like abundance of them, but guarantee you all summer long, you're gonna find flowers on that plant uh, from April all the way to August. It's so spectacular. And then in the fall, it'll get shades of, of um, yellow and burgundy and orange. Um, anyway, fantastic plant can take part shade. It can also take um, full sun. Then on the right hand side, this is more of like a water, water smart sort of style garden. This is a garden up here in Fort Collins that um, Blaine Matthews has done and he's done a fantastic job. He was, he worked at uh, Little Valley Wholesale Nursery and he was getting all these plants that he liked and putting them in these yards. This was, be, you know, long ago. And then I, when I started conversing with him a little more, he's like, oh, I didn't realize that these are all plant select plants. So what you see back here is you see this plant, the uh, Linum narbonensis, that's the uh, Narbon blue flax. Then we also have Panchito, Manzanita here. Um, right here, he actually has the raspberry, the Granita raspberry, uh, Devil Sperma. And, and our ice plant. And then here he has a coral baby, um, Penstemon. Now this all blooms. I think I took this picture in April or in May is when I took that picture. And um, those will bloom for several weeks, three weeks. Uh, the, line, the, the, the flax back here, I get a lot of questions about why don't we use the native flax, you know, that grows all through the prairie. Well, when you see the Narbonne blue flax, you'll see that it's a little bit more adapted towards urban areas. Um, it's a little more perennial. It, it can, it can self-sow, but it doesn't self-sow very far. You find it just by the base. And so it sort of creeps out. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when I'm weeding, I don't recognize the babies and I ended up weeding them out when I didn't want to. But it has a beautiful five petal, little blue sapphire sort of color to it with a white center and white edges. But it looks exactly like the native one, which is what the Linum leuinensis. But the leuinensis, the native one, is more of a vase shape. It's not as long lived, and it doesn't like being in gardens that are like a water smart garden, such as this. Uh, it really needs a community of plants, and it moves around a lot more. Um, but at any rate, a lot of times when plant select chooses plants and people ask, why didn't you pick the native one? It's because our urban environments are not native environments anymore. And this plant will do better. And hopefully the insects that utilize the native flax also utilize this one because it blooms at the same time, looks the same. But I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know. But I'm, I would think that they would. I see bumblebees on these things and they're native. Here's another great plant. So as Colorado moves feature or two great plants, as Colorado moves further into the future, I think our seasons are going to extend longer and longer and longer. So this plant on the left, that's Thermopsis lupinoides or golden candles. Um, this is a plant from the Kazakhstan uh, area and it's selected because it is a clump and it doesn't go to seed at all. Now, uh, once again, we do have natives here in, in in uh, the North America, but they creep around a little bit. Uh, gold banner is what they're known by. Um, and they can get out of, they can get unruly in a garden setting. This one can get large, it can get two feet tall, it can get three feet wide. Um, it's, it's pretty one dimensional in terms of its bloom, but when it blooms, it's like mid April, late April, and it goes all the way through Mother's Day. And it's this prime yellow. And anybody who sees this plant goes, God, it just hits you right at the right time. And it seems to navigate these storms really well, like it'll snow and then you'll think, oh, it's gonna be out and it'll be done or it'll freeze and it doesn't. Um, just a fantastic plant. Uh, so that's uh, golden candles. And then on the right-hand side, just it blooms just a little bit later than that in May is a Mongolian Bell's clematis. Now this is a bush clematis. 
not the kind that you put out a trellis and then it grows up into, but a, a, a one that grows on the ground. And then, um, you know, come June, it'll put on seed heads and there are these wispy balls of little fuzzy seed heads and they're beautiful. But if you cut this plant down to the ground, um, it'll actually rejuvenate and flower again. And then it'll go to seed in the fall and you'll have that texture in the fall to appreciate, but it's kind of like a delphinium. You can get multiple blooms out of this plant if you manage it. Uh, the one down point, it gets up to what, about 12 inches tall, but the, the one issue with it is, is it does lodge as it, as it matures. So in the spring, it comes up really nice and straight. And then as it matures, it just opens up and then you see that hole in the center. So be sure to put that by other plants that are a little bit more sturdy. Um, I don't really encourage putting cages in your in your garden because that to me looks, you know, kind of weird. So I try and make it as natural or I just cut it back and let it rejuvenate. So if you don't have chocolate flower by now, this goes in a prairie, this goes in a water smart garden style, uh, no water at all. It can self sow around and if you water it some, it definitely does self sow more. But in the evening and in the in the morning, if it's still, it'll smell like Hershey chocolate. And it is one of the best flowers, it's so beautiful. Um, it blooms from June until frost. You can't go wrong with this native plant. Um, gets about, uh, can get what, 12 to 16 inches tall, but it can get really, it starts leaning over and it gets wider and wider and it can get a foot and a half, two feet wide, but it's great to put around. Um, and that's probably as it becomes multiple plants as well put around rocks or let it hang over edges of retaining walls. Um, just an incredible plant. Now on the right, um, you wouldn't believe it, but in 2022, we're gonna be promoting a pine leaf penstemon. It's a compact one called half pine. Um, this actually was found by David Solomon, uh, native to uh, the Santa Fe area actually. And in June, it puts out a scarlet red, a uh, trumpet flower that'll attract hummingbirds and butterflies and pollinators. Um, it only gets to about 10 inches tall. It's a beautiful clump forming uh, penstemon. And what I really like about a lot of the penstemons is that you can, in the fall, when they go and they stop flowering and you know if you want the seeds or not, it'll, it'll self sow and it'll actually, if there's no other pine leaf penstemons around, it'll come true to itself. But when you trim that down to the basal foliage, that foliage is going to be evergreen through the rest of the winter. So in the sunny spots where the snow melts, you're going to have these beautiful little tiny clusters of penstemons that, you know, the, 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 the leaves are about maybe a centimeter long and they look like pine needles, but they're soft, they're not sharp. So that's why it's pine leaf penstemon, but you would get texture of green in the garden in the wintertime. Fantastic. Here's another couple plants that are in the same hydrozone. They bloom sort of the same time. You can look at them differently. Uh, I put them in there because they have summer interest and they have winter interest. The herbaceous um, uh, evergreens, really. The one on the left is was promoted in 2021. This is Drew's Folly. It's a plant, it's a hardy snapdragon is what it is. And it grows to about 12 inches tall. It's good for borders. You can put it out in a rocky area like it is there. Um, and it'll get about 16 inches wide. And then in, in I don't know, late May, June, it will bloom and it'll just cover itself with this pale sort of, core, you know, kind of seashell color snapdragon look. But it's a hardy one and it'll come back year after year. Now the branches are sort of brittle on it. So like I have dogs and I find that when they run nearby it, they can break stuff off really easily. But it makes me think about uh, the winter time. You don't wanna put this where you're gonna shovel snow onto it, um, but a great little muffin plant uh, for a rock garden or water wise. And on the right is another uh, plant. This one's actually from the Baltics. Um, that's the Dalmatian pink cranes bill, it's a geranium, um, pink, and it blooms in May and June as well. But it's a really nice creeper. It just keeps creeping out. You won't find seeds, but it gets into this larger and larger sort of uh, evergreen um, plant that does turn fall color. It will get reds and yellows, but there'll always be some greens in there. And as a matter of fact, there it is on the right-hand side 
um, that's around uh, Rosebush at a friend's place in Berthoud. And uh, that, that was taken in the dead of winter. I think it was in uh, December or January, one of the two. But at any rate, you can see it gets to about a foot tall or a little bit taller. Um, and then the one on the left is actually that uh, Drew's Folly in my rock garden at home. Uh, that was taken just four weeks ago or something like that. But you can see the foliage is still there. And if you actually treat this wet plant well in the fall and trim it back so that it can bud out again and make it a tighter bun, I think you're gonna have a fantastic dark green plant to look at through the winter. So another, the, one of the game changers in I think Colorado's style of landscapes are these three plants. Um, we first came out with the center one our plant selected, it's the mock bearberry. It's the first one that is uh, the first Archistaphylus that was more than a kinnikinnik. It's Coloradoensis. It's kind of a, a hybrid between, uh, I believe it's Nevidensis and uh, Usaversi, which is the kinnikinnik. So it's a little bit larger. It grows a little bit taller. And um, in the summertime, it's a dark green, wonderful. It's low growing and it just creeps out and it can creep out a couple feet uh, easily. Um, wonderful evergreen plant, but in the wintertime, it turns that sort of orange plant, or orange, reddish, burnt color. So up here, though, is Panchito, and you can see Panchito is another hybrid of, uh, of uh, Coloradoensis, and it grows a lot taller. Um, it grows to, it can grow to 12, 16 inches, and it stays really green all winter long. This is the game changer for Colorado in sense that it's got this mountain feel to it, but it's re and it's a broadleaf evergreen, but it can fit in all the garden situations. I love it that our plants, you know, full sun is great uh, in Colorado, and I encourage planting in full sun. This can take part sun, it can take full sun, it can take once a week watering. I think in a lot of cases it can actually take no watering, um, but it has little itty bitty bell flowers that actually bloom in February. I've seen them bloom in January and even in December. But when there's nothing else, you know, flowering, this plant really can do that trick and offer bees and other insects if they wake up in the winter time and are out foraging around. This is the plant that can actually do that and offer that. Um, but that's a great plant. We don't need boxwoods out here. We've got manzanitas. Then this is another favorite of mine and it's so underutilized. That's actually a mountain lover. That's Pachystema crambii, and it's a plant from the East Coast. It's actually native to, I believe, North Carolina. And it gets about 12 inches tall. It doesn't flower at all, but it stays this dark green, little itty bitty leaves uh, color, and it's just a muffin. And it can take full sun, and it can take, uh, I would say part shade. I wouldn't say full shade, but part shade. And I like it because in the full sun, it actually gets a bur more of a burgundy color in the wintertime. If it's in part shade, it stays that really nice green. Um, one of the best examples I saw of it was down at Jeffco. I'm trying to think of a demonstration garden there. Ruth might have it in one of the demonstration gardens in Greeley, but I don't remember seeing it, but there's only a few places that have it in mass or it's mature enough where you can really appreciate it. So anyway, uh, more to this summertime, wintertime interest and in looking. Now, one of the best all time plants in the world has got to be Canna Creek buckwheat. I mean, it's native to the Western slope. Uh, it's found out near Grand Junction. And uh, look at that green on the left-hand side where the sign is, that's the foliage in the spring. That's like May. Um, behind it is Pawnee Buttes, which can get to about 16 inches tall. Uh, small white flowers. It does fruit and you can eat the fruit, but I rarely see it on Pawnee Buttes. And I think that a lot of times the birds either get it or um, it, 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 it just doesn't, it doesn't produce a lot of fruit, but the, the, the flowers are wonderful. They are fragrant and then emerge the leaves right behind it. Um, and as you go through the season, you can see that in the fall, the, the buckwheat on the right hand side starts to turn this incredible red color. So it, it flowers yellow in June and after it's done flowering, uh, I just cut the, the seed heads off and then prepare it really for the winter look because you wanna be able to see that red. Um, behind it, you can see the structure of the Pawnee Buttes. 
Uh, Pawnee Buttes turns a beautiful sort of red auburn color in the fall. Um, now the native species, uh, it is a native, but the native uh, straight species of Prunus bessii can get six feet tall. And when you go out into the prairie and around the ditches and things and see them, they have fall colors that can go from yellow to orange to red. Um, but Pawnee Buttes is a consistent sort of burgundy color. It's a beautiful one. So in the fall, this is uh, on the right, lower right-hand side is the Canna Creek again in full bloom. And this is perfectly paired with a juniper. Now that's not a plant select juniper, that's a buffalo juniper and that can get like 12 inches tall and I've seen them get taller. But this is a median where the watering is really hard. But look at the combination there. Now in 2021 or 2022, plant select is promoting uh, Guernsey green juniper horizontalis. Now this was a plant discovered by uh, uh, Kelly Grumman's um, up by Guernsey in Wyoming. And it's a horizontalis, which means it's only gonna get about three inches tall. This is gonna be a perfect plant for medians you can put with your can of creeks. And the nice thing about it is, is that it's green. It's green all year round. I mean, I think the nursery industry was always so interested in different kinds of plants. They got all these blue junipers and they forgot about something that's really pleasing to the eye is green. But this will get three inches tall, and if you let it grow out, it'll get it'll get really big, you know, 10, 16 feet wide. But it doesn't have to. But I see this as a, you know, there's no water involved with it. You can see in this right-hand picture, this is the actual mother plant. It's actually suppressed all the other grasses in that prairie. Uh, I, I'm I'm glad to see these things come in because we can utilize them in the landscapes and save tons of water and have combinations of beautiful things. So look at this, the manzanitas, again, this is Panchito, paired up in another median with uh, flowering uh, Canna Creek buckwheat. I mean, this just this just doesn't end. It's, you, and then in the wintertime, when those the yellow's gone and you have that purple kind of red color plant, along with a green evergreen uh, plant, it's just, it's wonderful. I think Colorado is gonna achieve a style and we aren't there yet. It's out to be discovered. So what about this plant? This is a 2021 uh, plant select plant. This is actually from uh, Lesotho as well. That's why it's named Hoku Betsy. Uh, the, the local tribe is what, this is what they call this shrub. It's a woody shrub. It's very woolly and fuzzy. Um, it blooms in June and July, those yellow colors. Now it can get quite big. It can get three to four feet tall. So when you look at this plant, um, this is a nice size plant right now. But when you see it in a container, it's not gonna look like this and you'll kind of have to picture it growing bigger. Then you'll have to kind of picture, well, where, what kind of a garden does it fit in? What kind of style? And what kind of style are you going for? This would be a perfect water smart garden. Uh, once a week watering down to nothing on this. Uh, it can take full sun, part shade. Uh, I think that um, it looks like a sage. It looks like something native to our plains. Um, but it's not, and it offers a different size of that silver color because it can get quite large and it'll stay that way all winter. So this plant is gonna be hard to find this year. I know that because it's a harder plant to propagate. Um, so it's taking more time than we thought. This next plant, I'm really excited to see. I'm buying some to get into trials as fast as I can. And even though I talk with Kelly all the time, that's Kelly Grumman's, I talk with people all the time. There's not a month that goes by that someone says, oh yeah, have you ever seen that plant? And I'll be like, no, and I didn't know it, but this plant's growing in golden. It's Arctostaphylus patula. Now patula is native down towards the Four Corners area and the leaves are really huge. They're super beautiful. They almost look eucalyptus-like um, if I were to akin to it to a different plant, but that's six feet tall. Where's that plant gonna go? And I can say that I can see this plant being utilized all over in landscapes. Now the bark of all those Arctostaphylus are like a caramel, um, except for the mock bearberry, but the larger ones, they're caramel reddish, beautiful bark. So if you were to thin that out and trim it up, you'd see more bark and it would have more of a small tree look appearance to it. But think about where we're gonna be using these kinds of plants. Where would designers use them? Where would you want one? Probably where you would have put uh, one of those you know, large junipers they did in the 70s, you know, long time ago. But this is just soft and beautiful and doesn't smell. Um, fantastic plant. So one of the other garden styles I didn't really touch hard on here 
And it's, it's still growing in popularity, but basically it's a crevice garden. I love talking about them, they're fantastic. The idea is you put all these rocks really close together and then the water it has, it's forced to go down those crevices and the roots just love that. They actually get more water because the, the larger rocks don't absorb, they, it runs off. Um, but this is what a typical uh, crevice garden looks like. And this it is a style born out of Czechoslovakia. And because of a couple people here in Colorado, I think Colorado is becoming a hotbed for this style. This uh, is in the Alpine Garden in Mike Kinchin's area. And he's friends with Kenton Seth and Kenton Seth lives in um, Grand Junction. And he is becoming really nationally known as the crevice garden uh, designer and expert on media and everything else. It uses a different kind of media. It's not topsoil, it's very porous. And you'd think that uh, having a sandy porous media would be would require more water. And just the opposite is true in reality um, because there's no capillary action. Once the water goes into sand, so let's say you just have a sand pile, you water it in, you water it in, it gets wet all the way to the bottom. Then when you start digging in, you can see that the four inches, maybe six inches will dry out. But after that, there's no capillary action for the water to get evaporate out. It's actually got basically four inches of mulch on top. So unlike regular topsoil, those, that capillary action, it'll actually pull it out. So I really like crevice gardens. I think they can be done once a week, watering wise or less. This is another one. I, I, I encourage you to go for inspiration down to 82nd and Sims uh, at the wiffle ball courts or the pickleball courts down at um, Apex. On the west-hand side of the pickleball courts is this large crevice garden. And you can kind of see that there's some similarities, but it's getting a little bit more broad, like the, there's more protrusion of the rocks and it's more dramatic. And it makes for, it's so much fun to install one of these things. You do fairy gardening, I don't, but it's addicting. Like fairy, the gardening is addicting from my friends that do it. It's, it's so much fun. Um, at any rate, we have a snow mass, uh, Veronica down here. We have Woodward junipers in here. And there's a ton of other plants as well that are plant select plants that do great in this environment. Um, there's so much to learn. Now, uh, Kenton Seth actually maintains this garden as well. And he lives in Grand Junction. He has 10 hours of maintenance for this a year. So, you know, that's how low maintenance it is. And I don't think the irrigation is even on there anymore, but it was supposed to be watering once a week. This is Eve. Uh, she's an owner in Harlequin's Gardens, and she built her own crevice garden uh, years ago. And it's just on the corner where it's hard to have things or plant things that people don't trample on or stuff like that. And behind her is her house, and it's a it's kind of a jungle, and she's high, hidden off. But there are spaces for these gardens that don't need water, and it just looks so beautiful how the rocks are arranged. Um, she does have penstemon, a silver, silver, silverton penstemon in here, but it's not flowering right now. I think that's that back there. They, she also has the uh, seafoam sage, which is an incredible plant that doesn't need any water. But um, I encourage you to think about taking out a spot and doing something like this because it's really helpful to the native bees. The, 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 Whitney Cranshaw was talking to somebody the other day about how this style of gardening is allowing native bees that burrow to have habitats. Because when I, I put in a garden at my house like this uh, just recently, and um, within a few days, I saw lots of holes in the sand itself, in the media where things were digging and they were spiders and they were bees. And it was wonderful. It was really quick. Um, anyway, I encourage you to do that. This is the crepe garden now you can kind of see it's kind of moved away from the real crevice it's real dramatic it's almost mountainous um, but it's not montane per se you know it doesn't have big pine trees or anything but this is up at the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens Kent and Seth put this in I'm hoping that we can actually produce this plant right here um, this or it's actually this plant right here there's several there's two of them there's one two these are different color yellows but this is a verbascum it's actually native to Turkey. It's hard to propagate, but it is a tough, no water plant, gorgeous silver leaves, oh, beautiful. Anyway, um, those are plants I hope to do more in the future, but these styles of gardening, um, I like to just tell you about the plants that are gonna take the least amount of water. All right, thank you. Thank you.